the what we call chemtrails um, geoengineering and uh, this is a this is a big topic um, the history of our race right now very much depends on resolving this issue satisfactorily um, I'm waiting to see if we got our guest online or not and uh, cue from the producer This is where uh, radio, <laughs> this is where my radio um, felt more comfortable. We did transitions. We would take a break, play some music, and bring the guest in. And uh, video gets a little uncomfortable sometimes. But we'll just hang out here, and uh, hopefully our guest makes it on. Like I said, we're going to be changing uh, times. We'll be one hour earlier. In North America, that will be at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Daylight Savings Time. So you can do the math across the time zones in the United States. Problematically, I still don't know what the hell time it is in Europe. I, Europe is very schizophrenic about this. And we have all these time zones that... <laughs> are very difficult to coordinate. You have to do math. Uh, I usually have to pull up the world uh, time zone calculator and do this. So, um, Biggie, give me a, a cue if we, if we have our guest or not. If not, I may just... Uh, no guest yet. Let me check. I'll tell you what, I'm going to throw up a screen here. I wish... Uh, boy, this is where I wish we had music. Okay, so give me about uh, a minute here. And great. Now it says my internet connection is unstable. Lovely. <clears throat> this is Michael Murphy. Hello. Good evening, Michael. How are you? This is Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet TV, and you are live. Oh, great, Randy. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing good. Uh, I know sometimes getting in on these things can be challenging. Thanks for joining me. And uh, let me go ahead and flip up my video here. I uh, took myself off, off air. Uh, anyway, let me introduce you. Uh, my guest for this hour is filmmaker Michael J. Murphy. And uh, he's the producer presently of two films, um, what in the world are they spraying and why in the world are they spraying? Probably the two biggest questions we can ask right now. Michael, as we were uh, kind of on break here tonight, um, one of the things I pointed out was that I think the question of geoengineering, aerosoling, chemtrails, whatever we want to call it, is the core issue of our time. Um, as you will go into um, your discussion with me this hour, the survival of humanity really relies right now on resolving this issue. And um, your films obviously did a lot of journeyman's work in terms of bringing out the issues with, with the people that you had in the two documentary films. Let's go into the groundwork a little bit first of who is Michael Murphy, and how in the hell did you wind up making movies about about uh, geoengineering and chemtrails? That's what I ask myself every day. Um, <laughs> it, it, it really wasn't uh, a plan to get involved with filmmaking, but I learned about this probably 2008, and uh, I moved out to Los Angeles and was really having a hard time, you know, getting work and. So I decided to, you know, start addressing issues that were important to me. So I uh, found that I did pretty good in front of the camera. So I contacted a friend uh, initially and I said, hey, let's, uh, let's go out to Hollywood Boulevard. I want to see how many people are aware of chemtrails. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was aware of them, but not obviously the depth that I'm aware of today. And, you know, m much to uh, not my surprise, very few people knew what was going on. Uh, they were spraying above us, and, and nobody really knew what was going on. So we released that. It was called uh, Environmental Deception, the difference between a chemtrail and a contrail. Mm -hmm. And it did pretty well, you know, for, for a chemtrail film. But um, somebody had invited me 
about a month or two later to an AAS meeting, a geoengineering conference. And initially I said, oh, I'm not interested in geoengineering. You know, I really want to focus on this chemtrail issue. And they said, that's what it is. You know, you, you have to go. So we went and listened to geoengineers for several days, talk about the, uh, the, con the risks, the consequences of geoengineering. And really, it, it matched everything that we were seeing, um, which was very concerning. So from that point, I wrote an article titled, What in the World Are They Spraying? Released that, and uh, it got disseminated in uh, several different languages, really around the world. So uh, after that release, people started contacting me and asking me if, uh, if I would document this. So uh, the documentary started, and uh, I started uh, you know, going with those plane tickets when people sent me plane tickets out to areas, interviewing people like Francis Mangles, uh, a biologist, finding out about the changes in our soil pH, uh, heavy amounts of aluminum, barium, strontium, and uh, in our rain test. So, um, but then I was uh, I was interviewing G. Edward Griffin, totally unrelated to, to geoengineering. Mm -hmm. Funny because uh, Paul, who uh, we brought on as a co-producer, he said, "Whatever you do, I don't want to wreck this interview. Don't talk to him about chemtrails." Well, when the crew was setting up, I was talking to uh, Ed in his kitchen, and he said, "Well, Mike, what, what are you working on?" And I said, "Well." You ever hear of an issue called geoengineering? He goes, yeah, yeah, I'm very, you know, very interested in that. When we were talking, Paul came into the room and he, you know, he heard me talking about this and he gave me a look like, how dare you? <laughs> You're talking to him about Ken Trails. Anyways, after um, the interview, uh, Ed said, hey, you know, I, I, if you don't mind, you know, maybe I'd like to get involved with this project. I could probably help you fund it. And, uh, <laughs> Anyways, long story short, we ran a funding trailer, uh, included G. Edward Griffin, raised, you know, a substantial amount of money just literally in the first week. And when the world, Ali Spring was done eight months later, it came out, um, was really a hit. I mean, several million people saw it. It was translated into several different languages. And really, uh, probably uh, mostly responsible, of course, activists from around the world um, did much of the leg work, but for waking people up and, and starting the movement that we have today. So uh, about a year and a half later, started working on Why in the World uh, Are They Spraying, released that. Millions of people saw that film, screened it at the United Nations, and uh, literally have traveled uh, mostly U.S. and Europe screening this film. But it's helped a lot of people wake up um, to what's happening uh, right, above our, right above our heads, usually on a daily basis. Yeah, it's interesting. I went on to um, Amazon and I was looking at the reviews on the uh, two videos and how many people commented on there that this was their wake up call. A lot of people saw, you know, interviews that you did over the years, people like Alex Jones and stuff and picked these videos up and began to apparently pass them around. So the awareness is higher now than it was. You're talking about 2008 which I think was, I became aware of this probably around 2000, although I began looking at what was going on in the sky probably in the late 1990s somewhere. Do we have any idea of formally when they began this program? Oh, I, I think geoengineering has been around since probably the 50s. Not uh, obviously as, as heavy as it is today, you know, but probably... Mm -hmm. I would say full-scale deployment probably in the mid to late 90s. And uh, they're ramping the programs up more and more. Every day we have more aluminum, more of the primary geoengineering ingredients being found in rain tests around the world. It was interesting because when we released uh, What in the World, people started testing the rain. And uh, so because of that, you know, we, we have a good indication of course, And, of course, unfortunately, they're increasing, causing – not a lot of damage, but uh, again, probably the mid to late 1990s. And looking back, you know, I I always think, how did I not see this? You know, prior, uh, probably 10 yeah. years when, yeah. and I knew the weather was changing. I lived in Arizona, uh, where it's supposed to be sunny over 340 days uh, of the year. When I went out to college in the late 80s, 
you know, every day was sunny, except when a storm came through. Mm-hmm. So I went back um, as an educator. I, I taught um, for a couple of years out there. And when the kids were out on the uh, playground, I noticed, you know, like four or five days had this, you know, this cloud cover. And I didn't really make the connection to the plane spraying. It was after somebody had told me, you know, watch that plane, you know, and you'll see what what's behind it will turn in to what appears to be high clouds. And uh, that was uh, that was kind of my wake up call. And then I made the connection. Yeah, something's definitely changing. Now, in your research, have you been able to determine exactly what the intentions are for doing this? Because quite honestly, I have never been able to formulate in my mind, and this goes back to this goes back to the 1950s in my research of what they were thinking putting fluoride in. Well, I know what they're thinking, but how they sold this to the public because fluoride's a byproduct of aluminum manufacturing. And so now all of a sudden we're faced with a situation where they're putting both aluminous, aluminous oxide and barium into the air, and they're calling it geoengineering. What are they engineering and why these two particular elements, both of which are particulates that are hostile to human biology? Well, um, they're they're probably engineering more than we could even imagine. So I think a, a lot of objectives can be met by putting aerosols into our sky. Um, one of which we covered in why in the world are they spraying was the, uh, the weather control aspect of this. And, uh, no question aerosols are required to control the weather. So it's, it's actually a pretty simple process because the, the main ingredient is aluminum. And if you look at the properties of aluminum, uh, it's a very effective conductor in our sky. Uh, we see lightning, going up, increasing rapidly around the world. Uh, just unheard of lightning um, all over the place. But uh, in terms of, uh, of the conductivity through the harp system or other, uh, other uh, you know, types of technologies, they have the ability, whether it's RF energy, to heat that metal up. And when they heat it, what it does, it, it rises. And in that rising, it literally creates a low-pressure vacuum. So mm-hmm. you can steer storms or pull storms into an area. Um, uh, through the harp system, they have the ability to manipulate the jet stream. So uh, a good example of that now is the polar vortex, which uh, off the shore of California. Meteorologists are scratching their head going, oh, my God, this polar vortex is creating drought in California. You know, it looks, you know, we've never seen anything like this. And what it's doing is keeping the moisture and as well as, you know, the warm area over California due to the high pressure. But it's bringing that moisture in the warm air up into the Arctic. So uh, as a result, it wants to naturally rebound. And in that rebounding, it brings all of the cold weather from the Arctic down into the Midwest and on the East Coast. So we've had... Um, in the Midwest right now, we've had very cold summers and very cold yeah. and wet winters. And the East Coast, extremely cold, cold as well. Yes. But just, in, for instance, a couple of weeks ago in Anchorage, you know, it was like yeah, the highs were in the 50s, but South Carolina or North Carolina, the highs were, you know, right around zero. Just unheard of temperature fluctuations. So that's one way in terms of the mechanics that the weather can be manipulated. They also, anytime you put an aerosol into the sky, it affects the way that clouds condense and nucleate. So right. you can literally you know, put something into a cloud and uh, break the cloud up so that the moisture drifts. Actually, uh, aerosols, these nanoparticles, they act as what's called cloud condensation nuclei. So instead of falling as rain, uh, when water molecules condense, they condense on these tiny aerosols and it drifts. And that's why we get floods some places and in droughts and in other areas, exactly what we're seeing. So it's, it's kind of a simple technology in terms of, uh, of weather control. But I think there are a number, again, of applications and, and things that can be achieved with these programs. You're talking not just, well, there's a number of fronts here. Uh, first off, the commercial aspects, but I'm thinking more along the lines of weaponized weather and weather warfare. Is, is, that, is that a component to this that you're examining? 
Oh, without question, yeah. Yeah, I mean, weather, weather warfare has been, you know, in, in trusted military since the late 1800s, and, and the idea in terms of warfare, there are many different levels of it and many different layers, but uh, just looking at it, you know, let's say, oh, you want to have a battlefield advantage, you know, looking back to the Iraq war, you know, I remember somebody said, oh, my God, you know, it's amazing. God is really on the side of the U.S. because these tremendous sandstorms came in and really, yeah. you know, put the Iraqis in, in a disadvantage, you know, and before mm -hmm. I knew about the control, you know, it seemed likely. However, now it's very likely that, that those conditions were engineered. Um, another way, you know, you can destabilize uh, a country by creating drought. Food prices go up or there's not enough food quickly. You know, you have destabilization. So there are a lot of military in terms of warfare uh, applications. What we see here in the U.S., we're seeing organic foods. They're not growing anymore. So that's partially, you know, if you look at the Central Valley of California, Central mm -hmm. Valley provides 50% of the fruits and vegetables to uh, the entire United States, or it did. However, farms are quickly going under now, uh, obviously, because they have drought conditions. And what that does to the U.S., it makes us interdependent on our food supply. So uh, because of that, uh, because of the international need, the need to import foods, it's an excuse to raise food prices. could have to do with depopulation, but uh, it's also an excuse to create global governance. Uh, and the idea is if you're importing, let's say, avocados from Chile and things from Mexico, you have to have a global body to regulate that. So I think there are a number of different layers just from the food supply. And of course, we've seen in Why in the World Are They Spraying? We interviewed two farmers. One, I think if I remember correctly, had a 70% decline in the past 10 years of their food supply. The other was 50%. And what geoengineering does, it creates abiotic stress. And abiotic stress is uh, it's anything that stresses the soil. So it's too much moisture, drought conditions, fungal overgrowth, heavy metal contamination. Geoengineering creates all these conditions. So normally, you know, plants will die. It's mad. By 2030, USDA estimates that uh, organic crop loss due to abiotic stress will increase by 50%. So what does Monsanto do? They develop a seed that can grow in this new environment. So yeah. I believe that in part, you know, it has to do with a complete corporatization of our natural food supply. Um, well, not only that, but it literally is terraforming because you're changing the ecological balance of everything. I mean, we understand that our planet is an interdependent system, naturally not interdependent in terms of economics and government, but in terms of climate, normal climate, rainfalls, soil acidity, soil alkalinity, and things like that, it's an interdependent system that is being completely turned on its ear as a result of, of what, what they've been doing for the last 20 years. We'll just put that as kind of a peg for right now to understand what's going on. I mean, that's even if it's only a decade, it's long enough at the volume that they've been doing this to alter the ecological balance profoundly. Yeah, no, no question about it. And what I think the long-term goal is on this, it's really, you know, if we look at our ancestors, they were dependent on natural seeds, natural rain, and, and everything, and really could live independently from the corporate system. Now that natural life is dying, and we have companies like Monsanto redesigning life, it's literally, uh, you know, what a lot of religions talk about. It's just the shift of power from natural or the creation of God into the, the corporate system um, where they essentially become God. They become the author and designer of life. Yeah, it's what I call the beast system. It's, it's basically this, this horrible monster that just takes over the earth. Like a, it's like a Frankenstein creation. Right. Um, on the other side of this, and and uh, again, you know, there's this this touches on so many different fronts. We have all of these different 
elements being laced into them. We don't, maybe you know more than I do about this from your research, but do we have a base of what it is they're spraying? We know some of what they're spraying, but it seems like I've, I've heard reports and I believe it was Clifford Carnicon talked about the biological elements of the spraying as well, that they were actually finding tissue and even blood as a result of, uh, of a spraying. Were you able to ever isolate any of that or, or comment on it at all? No, you know what? We covered more of the weather control aspect. So the, okay. just the base link to geoengineering, but Clifford Carnicom has done wonderful work, you know, ranging from more gallons and yeah. the red blood cell issue. So I think that's, it's a real important aspect. I chose to uh, go with just sticking to geoengineering. And of course, the range of this issue is so broad. There are so many rabbit holes. Yeah, and the are. reason I did that was our goal is to, you know, affect legislation to get these programs stopped. So when you're reaching out to the masses, you know, it's kind of hard to talk about more gallons because the fact that weather control, which, you know, is very obvious to many of us, that's far-fetched for a lot of people. So I looked at, you know, what is the best way to uh, – to initially reach people with this message so that they'll accept it with hopes that they'll, you know, they'll go into the deeper levels of this. So I thought weather control and just sticking with that was probably the most prudent uh, way to address this. And, uh, you know, it depends on what, what circles I'm in, you know, and right. who I'm speaking that. to, you know. Yeah, it's a very yeah. nuanced message that you're putting out. Absolutely. The elements in this, and where I was going with it is, I, I worked around material science a good part of my life. Um, <clears throat> in laboratory and manufacturing environments, we have what are called MSDS, Manufacturer's uh, Safety Data Sheets, which detail the toxicity of elements, anything that's basically used inside of a laboratory or manufacturing environment. I can document with paper aluminous oxide and barium as being two of the elements that I'm very familiar with and that we are very familiar with as being key elements of the, um, the spraying. My question to you, and you know, I'm just tossing this out because it's, it's a question that I haven't gotten an answer on. How is it that in a closed manufacturing environment or a laboratory environment, these two elements are considered hazardous materials that need very controlled handling, but they wind up being sprayed like uh, just all over our environment. I mean, I, 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 there's such a disconnect that, that I sometimes run out of words to express this. How can these elements be sprayed like this when they're controlled substances in a closed environment? Well, we, we asked David Keith, you know, essentially the same question about, you know, toxicity of aluminum. He said there haven't been any studies. They're just looking into it. He lied. You know, there are studies obviously all over the place. Um, aluminum is very toxic, um, destroys our immune system. It's related to Alzheimer's and a number of other illnesses and even cancers because while you can remove it, and hopefully we'll talk about some of the ways that we can, you know, combat this, it's difficult to flush out of the system. So it binds up receptor sites and can lead to cancers. And a number of things is Dr. Bourne, you know, who we included in what in the world are they spraying, you know, clearly uh, expressed. So, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's not good for us. Uh, it definitely leads to depopulation illness on a number of levels. Barium, you know, very toxic, destroys our immune system, kidney failure, the list goes on. So, uh, strong team is carcinogen, you know? How can they put this into our sky? Well, I believe that geoengineering is the most effective way to consolidate an enormous amount of power, um, just from weather control alone. So I think they justify it, you know, depopulation, controlling food in a number of other ways. In all the conferences that have been held on uh, so-called climate change, the euphemism for global warming, they, they keep shifting back and forth. Does the subject of this come up as 
a means to stabilize a so-called unstable weather system or are they just dodging the issue completely that this in fact is a causative agent in the unbalancing of of the weather systems of the planet well here's what geoengineers addressed um and it was startling listening to you know the tapes of the conference and and they spoke about the fact that anytime you put an aerosol into the sky, it's going to impact the way that clouds, again, nucleate, um, and it essentially impact our weather. So they talk about droughts in certain areas, floods in other areas, potentially affecting uh, the su food supply of 2 billion people. You know, it's almost a quarter uh, of the planet's population, you know, if not more. So they said because of that, we are going to harness and control the weather deciding where rain goes. And <clears throat> what was even more concerning, they spoke about getting different countries on board and how to benefit the countries that sign on. And I think those benefits, they didn't go into detail. I wish I was there to ask them, but uh, I think some of those benefits are rain, you know, the, the ability to grow food. So let's say if a country in Africa, you know, doesn't sign on to this, are they going to be drought stricken and i think the answer to that is yes 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 i think we already see that historically the answer to that question um and <sighs> you know after a while you you just look at this and you go this is so sinister not only are they attempting to control the destinies of nations and and the weather and what goes on in our atmosphere, but basically, you know, this is godlike power that they're exercising on a scale that I don't believe we've ever, ever seen on this planet before. Yeah, I agree with you. And geoengineer David Keith even said geoengineering gives man godlike power. And uh, you harness the weather to put something that has been managed by nature or God, you know, whatever uh, term you want to say, to put it in the hands of men who are imperfect and have mm -hmm. all these desires, whether it be greed, power, whatever, is just ludicrous. And to think that something is not going to go wrong, I mean, seriously wrong, I mean, we uh, is, is just ludicrous. So, yeah, I mean, we have corporate interests involved with this. Corporations have, uh, you know, one goal, and that's profitability and they control our political system. So to think that corporations, which is our government, you know, essentially is, is yes. controlling the weather, you know, there's gonna be a lot of that are hurt by this. Um, few will benefit financially, but it's, it's, if we allow this to continue, I believe that it will be the downfall of, uh, of life on our planet. And, and I think, you know, in many cases it, it already is. At what level is the military involved with this? Because my sense is just observationally, and anecdotally I'll say this. One trip that I took, I flew into Phoenix, Arizona back in 2011. And I happened to be circling over Phoenix, uh, whatever cruising altitude you're at at that point, I don't know, 18,000 feet. But up above us, another maybe 1,500 feet, well, you know, safely enough a way to be uh, in, in, a, in a, a pattern over the landing area, was a plane owned by Evergreen Corporation, which was visibly spraying right above us as we're circling going into Phoenix. You know, and I came to find out when I got on the ground who Evergreen was, because some people I was meeting there... Uh, asked me about my trip and I pointed this out. So we have military private contractors doing this. Um, were you able to uncover any of the um, military connections to this as well, Michael? Well, I think there are many. If, if you look at, you know, owning, owning the weather by 2025 and you really look through that document, that was a uh, U.S. Air Force document, they specifically talk, you know, about putting aerosols and even black carbon not into our atmosphere for the purpose of, of controlling that weather. So um, has anybody come up and admitted this? No, there's been flat out denial uh, because these programs are illegal. They're very damaging. And uh, there hasn't been 
a global treaty. However, they're working very aggressively to make geoengineering programs legal. So that's something that, you know, we're looking at very closely and really trying to get my next film in unconventional shade of gray uh, out, you know, in, in hopes that it will be a call to action. People will come together and and uh, rise up to say, no, you know, we, we do not accept this. Where are the activist attorneys in all this? Because I think what we're talking about here, the the liabilities for this type of program are profound because we already have enough science to connect at least some disorders, some diseases. And, and I think that an open inquiry would reveal statistical relationships between escalations, especially certain immunodiseases that, that have paralleled the time that we've been engaged in these programs. So my question is, are there activist attorneys out there who are working in this realm who have the capability to begin maneuvering to file lawsuits? I'm, I'm currently in talks with some. What I've decided to do is put together a class action lawsuit. Um, so right now, uh, should be, by the end of the week, hopefully have a commercial out and also Good. a website. You know, and the purpose of that is is going to be just to collect names and uh, damages that people believe that they've had. And and uh, my belief is that if we have a million, half a million, a million people, then when we present this to a law firm or a lawyer, we can say, listen, you know, we have, you know, several plaintiffs. And I think it will be more appealing um, to go from at the other end, you know, not knowing how many people are going to be involved and in, in what the numbers are. I think it's more challenging. And we've been looking at that, you know, for a couple of years. And there's, you know, was one attempt by attorney Joe Marmon, you know, and he had, I think, 30 or, or so plaintiffs, you know, and came time to, you know, put forth money to move forward. Very few of the plaintiffs actually moved forward in that capacity. So he ran into a couple of speed bumps, and I think it was due to lack of participation. So we're looking to you know, look at some of the directions that he took and hopefully build on those and really put together something that's uh, viable and uh, will be sustaining in terms of ac accomplishing this. And I think once we start, you know, hitting, once we uh, get into exploration, you know, and start finding out, you know, specifically who's doing this and uh, coming up with damages, I think we will see a quick end to these programs. You know, damages are you know, in the several billions, I, I think it's uh, it's going to be very much of a catalyst to get it stopped. At this point in time, we are still kind of grappling with the technology behind this. I know, for instance, that you've interviewed Dr. Nick Begich, who has been years, decades probably now, uh, talking about HARP. Do we have any sense right now, Michael, specifically the HARP technology and how this interacts with HARP technology in terms of geoengineering? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the aerosols are a conductor, so it mm -hmm. makes the HARP much more effective. So uh, you, you can also use microwave technology, kind of like putting a cup of coffee in a microwave, you know, and, and heating it up. So it's uh, to manipulate the weather, it's very important to... Uh, to heat up certain areas of our sky. When they do that, you know, obviously you have jet stream deviations. If if you can manipulate, uh, let's say, expand, you know, a certain region of our atmosphere, it's gonna it's gonna manipulate jet streams or again pull um, pull weather systems into a certain area or out of a certain area. So yeah, it's they're very uh, they work together. They appear to work together. This is not just isolated to the United States, and I know you know that. Are there uh, a concerted, well, let's put it this way, are there coordinated groups of people working around the planet with a view on organizing this to eventually move it into an inquiry? I'm not holding my breath that the United States Congress will ever hold an inquiry into this, although that would be the ideal place to begin this. But do we have hopes that, for instance, we can get this to a place where we can open it uh, in the World Court in The Hague, for instance, or someplace like that, to get an open hearing, an indictment on some of the people that are there? I mean, I know I'm kind of 
shooting this out a little bit further than you're going right now, but you talk to a lot of people and what is your sense that we can push this internationally to the level where we get actual uh, coordinated efforts between people who are concerned about this? Oh, we do, you know, and, and it really has to do with us collectively uh, getting together on this issue. Our time is short, though. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, scientists, geoengineers, and governments right now are looking to form a climate treaty in France. Uh, their timeline is December of this year, and they're basing it on this idea that CO2 creates global warming. Um, once that treaty, if, uh, if it gets established, geoengineering is being sold as the quickest, most effective thing to do in terms of addressing climate change. Um, what is going to be a big focus on an unconventional shade of gray, we have geoengineering programs that are ongoing. Geoengineering programs, no question about it, change the temperature of our planet and they alter our weather. Uh, geoengineers now, uh, or scientists, are sourcing our adverse weather and the Arctic melting which uh, there are a number of cases, and I actually wrote an article, Geoengineering and the Deliberate Melting of the Arctic, that in the 70s, they deliberately started melting it. When it started melting, they said, oh my God, we have global warming, so now we have to look at carbon taxes, world government, you know, all of this transfer of, you know, potentially trillions of dollars of, of wealth into the hands of the few at the expense of our freedoms, a complete dissemination of, uh, not dissemination, but a complete erosion of our constitution and our country. And we're looking at people who are unelected, unelected individuals mandating the very ways micromanaging our lives who are not elected, circumventing the constitution and moving forward with, with this. So it's, it's a big concerning issue, but I really want to stress, you know, anybody that, that says, oh, CO2 is causing global warming, but we don't want geoengineering. No, I'm sorry. When you're pushing the global warming issue, the next incremental step in addressing that is geoengineering. And if anybody is arguing that point with me, I want them to explain to me why none of the current climate models have included geoengineering and how, how, I want to know how anybody can get an accurate temperature reading of the Earth's temperature in the past 30 years, being that these programs have been ramped up. And the answer to that question is no. Nobody can conclusively say whether the planet's warming or cooling. And because of that, this global warming issue, this climate change issue, that again, will dramatically change our lives, transfer trillions of dollars, destroy our nations, a nation that my ancestors shed blood for. I am qualified to be a son of the American Revolution. My ancestors died for our freedom. And they're, they're removing this from us based on a lie, based on a fraudulent model, a flawed model? No, until they stop spraying, and that's what has to happen. Stop spraying for five years, we will see whether the planet's warming or cooling. But you cannot put forth legislation and dictate my life based on something that's not provable. And it is not provable at all. There is no consensus in the scientific community that CO2 creates global warming. So it's, it's completely off the table in, as far as I'm concerned. And any activist that is tooting that horn and beating that drum, let me tell you something. That, those people, what they're doing, they're leading the activist community into supporting geoengineering because that's what's going to happen if I we wanted, don't stand up. Wanted, yeah, uh, thank you because I wanted you to go there. Um, I have concerns about the message that's being sent by certain elements within the geoengineering community right now and the message that's being sent. Um, and we, thank you. We had, a, we had an agreement. Uh, I know who you're talking about. And we promoted his website and put them on our films with the agreement that global warming would not come into the equation because I knew it would create division in the movement and I yes. knew that it would make our movement impotent. And I'm, I'm so upset about this because that person has deceived everybody. And when I wouldn't go along with it, there were character assassinations, several private phone calls that were made to destroy my reputation, called all of my funders, 
including a, a potential $2.5 million funder, mm-hmm. which would have completely changed the direction of this movement. And right now, you know, that person, let me tell you something. If, if they move forward with this global climate treaty, uh, he's going to be held accountable publicly because that's where he's leading people to support the very geoengineering. So you can come up with a lot of great articles and a lot of great detail, which will get attention of the movement. They've been doing this for years. They come into the movement and then they steer people into areas that are ineffective. And I'm telling you, to be effective, we have to say no to these climate treaties, stop geoengineering, and then we'll take a second look at this. And if anybody's saying a different thing, they are misleading people, and it's damaging to what I have given my life for and so many other activists have. And any other activist who has disagreed with this global warming issue by that same person has literally had their character assassinated. They have had front page website postings, anything to get our message out of the table. So it's very clear to me that this movement, which again, I have committed my life to and a number of other activists have, this movement has been diverted, it has been co-opted, and it's being driven right into the ground. And we're taking it back. We are taking it back and we're going to say no. Mm -mm. Yeah, I'm concerned about that because there's a trend uh, with specifically internet media and the ability to virally push out messages while at the same time basically pushing out other valid arguments as well. And I know you don't want to name the person. To my listeners, if you want to know who it is, contact me. I'll, I'll name them. Okay. It's, it's you, I'm fine with it. I'll be, I'll be very open. It's, it's Go ahead. geoengineering. It is Geoengineering Watch. I promoted that website. I brought it to millions of people with an agreement of this global warming issue. When I wouldn't go along with it, a lot had happened, and it's got to stop. Yes, there's a lot of great information, but they're using that information to push people into an area of inefficiency. This is life or death. It literally is life or death, and it's unacceptable. And I will not see people that I led this person to get deceived anymore. And, you know, that's as, as blunt as it gets. And until the truth comes out, which it will, which it will, the truth is now getting out. And when it does, publicly, he's going to be held accountable. I'm very emotional about this. I know and you are. Not- and, I, and I'm fine with that because I think it's an important aspect of what we're talking about tonight. That's why we're. And I also want to. Although there were a number of personal things, such as calling my wife, calling my family, uh, calling all of my funders, yes, there were a number of personal damages. But I have to put those aside and look at the movement as a whole. And when I see the movement getting damaged, it's time to speak up. It's time to wake up to the activist community. Because if we don't, if we allow this legislation to go through based on climate change, then. Geoengineering will be, without question, it will be legal, it will be initiated, and we have an uphill battle right now, but if they legalize it, our work is set back 20 years, and I don't know if we have that time left. So I see what's going on with this global warming message, the way it has been used to co-opt, to divert this movement, and it has to stop, and it will. In our next film, we're not, of course, not even going to mention this person, I won't even say their name, but it will be so clear as to what we have to do and why the global warming issue is so important to us, why it's so important to us in getting these programs stopped. So we might even put his name on there and say thanks <laughs> for, for your unrighteous deeds. We're really able to see, you know, where we had to focus on. Yeah. And that's a joke. You know, we're, we're not going to do that, but... Uh, I feel very passionate about this, and it definitely set our work back. You know, it set me back a year and a half, two years um, in my work. We don't have that time, and neither do the the 15 other very important activists that have been defamed, demeaned, character assassinated on that website. We don't have time for that. 
There's no time. These people are good people. They do good work. They deserve respect. They don't deserve to be called names. They don't deserve what has happened. And it's, it's going to end. <clears throat> well, I don't think it's useful either to engage in what I call fear porn, which is basically pushing the agenda that was expounded by the Club of Rome back in the 70s. I think it's more useful to step back and objectively look at the evidence. And as you pointed out, we don't have objective evidence right now because we're basically lightning in a bottle. We do not have uh, objective science that can say uh, climate change up or down because of the geoengineering. And then the attempt to supposedly, quote, legalize geoengineering after the fact is probably one of the most outrageous frauds that will ever be perpetrated on humanity if we don't stop it now. Much, if not all, the climate change that we've had, yeah, I, I believe that the climate has been changing, but it's due to geoengineering, and that is not in the models. And you cannot create laws based on a lie. You know, it's like buying a car without a transmission. And, uh, you know, trying to drive away and the dealer saying, no, 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 no. You know, it's, it's just, uh, there's, uh, not enough transmission fluid. So all you have to do is buy transmission fluid. The car will work correctly. No, it's not being disclosed and you cannot form laws until this issue is brought on the table and it is not. So I stand very firmly with that. And that's, uh, you know, that's a big part of, a lot of laws. Uh, I don't know if people are aware of this. Over 500 climate laws are scheduled to go into effect this year in 2015, all based on this issue of climate change. And when people find out, when the masses do, and they will, that climate change is caused by geoengineering, there's going to be a revolution. Well, we're seeing it because a lot of it's implemented and promulgated through UN regulations and then flowing downward to the level of local government. But I know we're seeing it even locally here in um, codes that are being uh, implemented on a local level. Rain, just things, simple things, rainwater collection, rediversion of water away from um, major waterways. Uh, that indicate, well, in Boston, in fact, they were not allowed to uh, plow snow into the Charles River. Um, it, we're, we're seeing the blowback now, and it's hitting us uh, in very specific areas of our lives because of the ongoing legislation that's being done. And a lot of it isn't legislation anyway. It's being promulgated by the UN. It comes out of the uh, Rio conference in 1992 and the efforts that were put out by uh, Mr. Gorbachev and more strong. I mean, this has been a very long arc that they've moved us towards on every front. Yeah, it's, it's Agenda 21, complete control of our lives. Yes. The population yes. is going to reduce if we allow it. The population is playing, that's death. You know, I serve a God, and my God is, yes. does not stand for population. Uh, I, I will stand by that statement 100%. And uh, it's, it all relates to this uh, global governance or new world order agenda, which is not in our best interest at all. And it's based on, on, on a lie. And my concern is if they develop the legislation and the government, and now Obama has a, uh, a climate education committee mm -hmm. of uh, – several governors and, and mayors who are going out to the local municipalities with a big sack of money saying, hey, you know, we've got programs, we've, you know, we've got some money, you know. So the federal government's coming in federalizing at the local level. And again, it's all about this shift and transfer of power for global governance. And uh, my concern is when, if this continues to build, it is not being built on a solid foundation of truth. And because of that, it will, any building that is not laid on a solid foundation is going to be shaky at best. Um, you and I and all of the listeners are standing on that foundation. It will collapse. It will. Lawsuits are going to come in. The truth is getting out. 
So my goal is to block this legislation so that we don't have this beast that's going to be built that could crumple overnight, yes. create catastrophic economic conditions around the world and, and literally bankrupt. And, and that's a very, very much of a concern for me. So those, again, who are perpetuating, and I know some people might be on the fence, it's okay. If you believe in global warming, please tell me. Please write to me and let me know how. Again, I ask this question, how anybody can get an accurate temperature of our planet with the ongoing geoengineering. Nobody has been able to do that. Why? Because it's true. It's absolute truth. And because of that, that should change your views immediately on global warming. And if it doesn't, write me and we'll talk about it. And that's how serious it is. Because anybody who is holding that belief is literally supporting something that is so damaging, so damaging to our futures, to our freedoms, to our livelihood, and to our health. And they're literally inadvertently supporting the legalization of geoengineering. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, maybe on the positive side here, because we do need positivity, I, I always try to stress that. You mentioned a little bit earlier uh, maybe some practical things that we could do, because obviously the toll right now on the biology of the human being is horrific. I mean, I look around at the effects of decades of this program now, and I see what's going on. Increases in immune diseases, Alzheimer's, increased uh, rates of heart disease, uh, heart, heart disease, diabetes. Um, do you have some hopeful, optimistic things that we can practically do in day-to-day -day life as well, Michael? Oh, very much so. And, you know, I think the important thing is that we're eating organic food so that our immune systems do not get compromised with, with the pesticides and everything else. So that's very important. I'm still working on that, you know, myself. But uh, also, yeah. you know, you can use chlorella, um, bentonite that removes heavy mm -hmm. metals, uh, SM. you know, a, a very good, uh, product. Uh, I started selling it actually, uh, I think, uh, organic sulfur.net is my website and that actually binds on to aluminum, other heavy metals and removes them from the body. So that's, those are just a, a couple of uh, effective things that we can do, but you know, I think, uh, staying healthy and my take is a, Healthy activist is a powerful activist. And when we're all sick, you know, it does re reduce our, our ability, you know, mm -hmm. to, to have stamina to move forward and complete what we have to do. So I recommend that, you know, people really start looking at uh, clean eating um, and, you know, certain supplements and read up about them. You want to study up about them. Some of them, you know, remove some vital minerals. So you're going to want to, uh, you know, look at how to replace those. But those are some things that we can do in our personal life in terms of getting healthy. Uh, in the broad range, you know, there are a number of things that we can do right now. I'm organizing a, uh, a march, uh, hopefully by the end of the summer, in Sacramento, which is going to address geoengineering and the global warming issue uh, with the attempt to uh, let our legislators know geoengineering is creating climate change until you address this we are not going to accept the mandates. And right now there's a carbon tax, you know, on gasoline and many other areas um, in California. So that's literally the, it's the testing ground. That's going zero general. right now as far as I can see. It is. It's, it's literally ground zero. So um, that's an area that we have to focus on. But uh, I'm also in the process of organizing a protest in France. Um, protesting these climate meetings. Now, uh, we have to be very prudent in terms of how we address this because there will be people outside, I'm sure, you know, demanding that this treaty uh, uh, comes to pass. And, you know, we had millions of people, what was it, four or five months ago, marching in cities all across America, demanding that our legislators do something about geoengineering. Well, when you demand that our legislators, who are largely sponsored by the corporate interest, do something, and you're not real specific about that, 
uh, you're literally setting yourself up to major failure. And obviously those people were not aware of geoengineering or the impacts that geoengineering has on our climate. If they were, they'd be demanding that geoengineering be brought in to the climate discussion, that these programs are halted, and then we come back to the table and see what the planet's doing. Because again, there's there's no way that an accurate temperature reading can be made until geoengineering is stopped, and that's my demand. And that will be my demand, and it will be demanded that we are not subject to these UN guidelines or even local laws that are related to geoengineering. It's based on fraud, and it will not stand. Um, the film that, that you're getting ready to release, do you have any? Uh, do you have a release date on? I'm sorry, I forgot the title again. Um, a diff, what is it? A different shade of gray. Close. It was going to be a different shade of gray. I got that while I was in the shower. Somehow, <laughs> when I'm in the shower, I get these. I get the names from my films. Yes. I have shampoo in my hair. I have to, you know, run out and, and write it down. I, I don't know if it's the water or what, but anyways, that a different shade of gray came, and then you know, I thought unconventional was. Uh, a little more catchy. So anyways, um, it's print film. And my goal is to get it done four months ago. And uh, right now we got a little bit of funding. I did a GoFundMe for Michael Murphy next film. You can actually find that on my Facebook page at What in the World Are They Spraying? It's posted right at the top. So I have enough to do some interviews, um, interviewed uh, did about five interviews so far. Cynthia McKinney, you know, a couple of other interviews mm-hmm. were going to be in that. And then I'm going to release uh, a funding trailer, although I am uh, setting up talks with with some very well-known producers in Hollywood, California that have an interest in this. Um, you know, we'll, it'd be nice. We'll hope and pray that they get involved because that should yeah. give us, you know, plenty of yeah. funding to get it done efficiently, to get it done right. However, you know, my, uh, I feel very strongly money is not going to change the way that I address this. So I'm very firm. Yeah, I, I take in suggestions. However, I do not uh, allow people to divert the message in, in yes. any way. Yes. So you know, if they're on board with the guideline, that's fine. If not, I'll get it done some other way. You know, my, money is not going to be the driving force in this film. It's going to be truth. And, you know, I'd rather have 10,000 people see a film, you know, that's based on truth that it can activate than, you know, 10 million people that, that see this and, you know, it brings in some form of deception. So that's not going to happen. Not to say it would, but we'll find out. Um, so anyways, my, my goal is to really release this funding trailer sometime probably in June. And it's going to be a call to action. So it's going to cover basically what we taught, uh, spoke about, and it's going to be promoting the, uh, the stopping of the legislation um, through various forms, including the class action lawsuit, but also the marches. And, you know, I, I just, I wish it was a year earlier um, because our, our time is, you know, the clock well, is ticking every it is, day. It, it is ticking. This, like I said, in entering intro, the show tonight, As far as I'm concerned, right now, this is the most imminent issue we're dealing with, because if we don't deal with this, everything else we're doing is for naught. Uh, We have to stop this, and we have to stop the attack on the message as well, the confusion that's been sewn into uh, the media presentation of global warming and geoengineering. You know, that was probably the nugget I would ask the listeners to take away from this interview tonight is to be very discerning about what's being said by certain high profile media people out there who have spent a lot of time, I think, obfuscating the message. Uh, There's no question. The the one thing it did, whatever, we can speculate what the reason is, you know, all day, and we probably will never find out. But what we know is what it did. And what it did was it took literally millions of people away from taking proactive and effective action in getting the legislation stopped. And that's my goal right now, not to say that is going to uh, stop geoengineering altogether, but it will buy us some time. And then we can come in 
with the lawsuits. And if anybody is talking anything different from that and diverting us from really going into the climate meetings, I mean, certain activists who went into the climate meetings got ruthlessly attacked on this website because of their views and their stance mm -hmm. on this. That is not acceptable in any way, shape, or form, and I'm calling him out. I am calling him out because I think it is so important, and uh, it, it's, it's stopping, and people are, people are waking up now, people all over the world. And uh, the main activists, you know, the core group that I speak to, maybe 50, 75 people, they all know what's going on. So the, the problem is that that website, because we, we put it on our films, I mentioned it, you know, to several million people on, uh, you know, hundreds of radio shows. We promoted it um, quite a bit. And the person who was a webmaster for a while obviously had problems, you know, backed out. You know, they they brought a real professional element in, into that website. So it's reaching out to a lot of new people and mm -hmm. with a lot of good information, but some disinformation. And that disinformation is the key to where we need to be. And I think it's kept a lot of people out of these climate meetings. So, you know, that's you know, hopefully the message is let's not go ahead and attack that person. Let's take our energy and realize the direction that we need to go. Because I took a Absolutely. real close look, a real close look at what happened to me. And there was no question this person had a very strong intent of taking me out. When you're calling family members, we estimate he made 200 private phone calls. You know, he even sent uh, emails to other, you know, geoengineering groups, urging them to withdraw their support from me. And he, I gave him all of my radio contacts. Uh, I've heard from several of them that they received phone calls from him, bad mouthing me. Really, it wasn't like it was a call or two. There was an agenda. It was almost like there was a there was telemarketing. A yeah. Oh, there's no question about it. There was a campaign, not only to me, but a bunch of other people. Uh, and it was all appears to be related onto this belief. So I took a real close look at this and I said, what is going on? And then I started looking how this belief, which apparently is very threatening to this camp, but how, if we held this belief, how it could uh, make us effective. And I saw it. I saw the light very clearly. So no question about it in, in my mind anyways, that, that, uh, this has been driven, you know, it's like a ship driven into the ground with, yeah. uh, you know, all the right words, all the right information, you know, 95% incredible information, smooth talking, and then boom, brought us into an area where we're not effective. Well, it's not over and we're moving in the direction of effectiveness and we will be successful in what we're doing because we saw it. And uh, I think they thought that they completely took me out. Uh, that's not the case at all. And I'm moving forward. And I learned. I watch people very closely when they start doing those things. And I ask a lot of questions in a research. And then I decide where to go based on what other people who I don't think are in integrity, obviously isn't in integrity, but I look at them and I say, okay, what's going on? Here's where we need to go. So it, it really kind of paved a very clear path in terms of where I'm going right now. So overall, you know, a lot of bad things happened, but it was good in terms of for me, for me being able to see, being able to move in the right direction yeah. and not, not be, uh, not be paired up. Uh, with this person because obviously there was influence, you know, uh, that he had in, in my life. He had my ear and, you know, we agreed on, on a lot of things. And uh, probably, you know, had I been yoked right now, this would not be the direction that we're going in. So it actually worked out for the good and uh, obviously made me a stronger person. And I think overall, you know, these tactics, they might work for a short time, but we have something so powerful and, and that's the truth. You know, 100% truth, not 90, 95% truth. We have 100% truth. And when we move, when we put that truth into action, we will see mountains move. And I think when the beginning of that. Well, we've got to wrap it up here, Michael. Um, last minute here, uh, call to action where people can find you and uh, anything you want to leave us with going out. 
Sure. Um, go to why in the world are they spraying.com. Now, if you haven't seen the film, you can, uh, you can watch it on the website, but also we encourage everybody who orders a DVD to make copies and hand out for free. So that's one way to support our work. Um, go to the what in the world are they spraying page. You'll see, uh, the GoFundMe campaign for, mm -hmm. for the funding trailer. We've raised probably $8,000, so I have a little bit of funding for interviews and for editing uh, and other things. But, we, you know, for a film, we need a whole lot more. So sure. if you can contribute, that would be well, wonderful. Of course, for you folks who are watching right now, that is streaming by you on the uh, – on the, on the video screen and that'll be posted out as well. So uh, those website links will uh, go very far and wide. Michael, I, I, I want to make available you, to you the invitation to come back anytime that you want to present more information. Uh, let us know when the, uh, the new video is released and uh, we want to you know, make this platform open to you any time that uh, you want to present some information. Oh, thank you very much. I'd love to. And uh, please send me the link if you can email that. Uh, this, absolutely, the link to the show. Will. I absolutely will. We'll get that out to you. That should be out this weekend. Um, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, thanks again for being with us tonight, Michael. We'll talk to you soon. Um, that wraps it up for this presentation of Off Planet TV. Uh, we'll be back next week in some fashion. Um, we'll let you know about the times. I'll post that stuff out as will the folks at CCN. This is off planet TV on the conscious consumer network. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside of you begin to really explore into it. We'll be back very soon. Good night.